Hello and welcome to our video summarising everything you need to know about the play Journey's End by R.C. Sheriff. My name is Barbara and in this third part of our video, we will be examining themes. Now do remember that this is the third of a three-part video series where we examine different aspects of the play, including the plot summary, which is video number one, the characters and quotes, which are included in video number two, and now in this final video, we examine themes. So let's get started. Now the first theme is to do with friendship and relationships. Now, this play showcases the effect that war has on personal relationships. In particular, Sheriff focuses on how wartime power dynamics and interpersonal attitudes alter how people interact with each other. This is most evident in Stanhope and Raleigh's friendship, which suffers because of the various stresses of military life. For the majority of his young adult life, Raleigh looked up to Stanhope, a classmate who eventually went off to war and became a captain. While Stanhope is off in the trenches of World War I, Raleigh stays behind and finishes school, all the while worshipping Stanhope as a hero. Later, when Raleigh joins the military, he is placed under Stanhope's command, but although he's ecstatic to join his hero's infantry, he soon discovers that his relationship with Stanhope is quite different. Not only has the war taken a toll on Stanhope's well-being, but his high position in the military also often forces him to treat Raleigh with rough indifference. In this way, Sheriff suggests that human companionship is highly contextual, something that grows according to the emotional circumstances that define the immediate environment. Like human beings themselves then, relationships aren't fixed or unchanging, but dynamic and adaptive. When Raleigh first reports to duty as an officer in World War I, he's overjoyed to have been assigned to Stanhope's infantry. He knows Stanhope from before the war, but when the, when the captain used to be a rugby hero several years his senior. Raleigh and Stanhope got to know each other and developed a friendship of sorts during the summers since the fathers were friends, and Stanhope also became romantically involved with his sister, who's now waiting for him to return from the war. Since this period, Raleigh has looked up to Stanhope and imagined him as a valorous captain. However, he doesn't know that while Stanhope is indeed a well-respected soldier, he's also turned into a gruff and pessimistic alcoholic. Upon arriving in the trenches, Raleigh speaks with Osborne, the second in command, and learns of Stanhope's transformation. Osborne is fond of Stanhope and also recognises that the war has had a harsh effect on Stanhope. He warns Raleigh that he shouldn't expect his relationship with Stanhope to pick up where it left off. Now, Raleigh doesn't seem to grasp that Stanhope has changed and said, assuming that his old friend, who's become an alcoholic, is still someone who would lose his temper over catching the subordinates drinking. Raleigh's conception of Stanhope is based on a frame of reference that can't effectively be applied to the current warlike circumstances. After all, the way Stanhope interacted with the people in boarding school as a role model has little in common with what he must now act, which is as a military captain trying to command soldiers in the trenches. Osborne, for his part, picks up on Raleigh's naive assumption that he'd be able to approach his relationship with Stanhope the way he used to. Now, Osborne tries to em emphasise that people change according to what's happening in their lives and if a person changes, it follows that the relationships will also change. Stanhope himself also seems to understand this, which is why he's unhappy that Raleigh has been assigned to his infantry. He knows he's changed for the worse and he comprehends that this means that his relationship with Raleigh will most likely change too for the worse. Of course, another reason Stanhope doesn't want Raleigh to understand how he's changed is because he fears Raleigh will write his sister and tell her how wretched Stanhope has become. To ensure this doesn't happen, he censors Raleigh's letters. And in their tense conversation, we find that Raleigh is unable to adjust to these new wartime circumstances. However, the rough exchange that they have exemplifies how both Raleigh and Stanhope struggle to navigate the new terms of the relationships during the war. Now, by examining the painful transformation between Stanhope and Raleigh's relationship, the playwright Sheriff makes it clear that friendship and human interaction is greatly dependent upon the surrounding interpersonal context. However, while relationships are certainly fluid and adaptive, Sheriff suggests that there are certain bonds that are more resilient than others. Osborne, for instance, proposes this idea to Stanhope, assuring that, the captain rather, that though his relationship with Raleigh has indeed changed, this doesn't necessarily mean the war will completely ruin their connection. Although Raleigh certainly notices how the emotional and psychological effect of the war has influenced Stanhope as an individual and Raleigh's relationship with Stanhope, we still see his admiration for the struggling captain, which will enable to let him go on liking him. In this way, Sheriff shows 
people that just because human interactions change according to the circumstances doesn't always necessarily mean that these human interactions are resilient. Though difficult environments like those presented by war force people to adjust in the way they interact with each other, this doesn't have to ruin what lies at the core of a friendship and in the final scene of Journey's End, Stanhope treats the gravely injured Rally with gentleness and care and the audience sees that these two men have maintained the connection even if the context of their relationship has profoundly shifted. The next theme is expectations versus uncertainty. Perhaps the most challenging thing the soldiers in Journeys End face isn't violence itself, however they face the threat of violence. Although the trenches are situated just 70 yards from the German enemies, the majority of the time is actually spent in nervous waiting and anticipation. In the long hours and even days between bursts of combat, the soldiers are left to grapple with their fear, which grows in intensity when the battlefront is calm. Indeed, most of the journey's end focuses on moments of calm, suggesting that the psychological elements of fighting a war can be just as harrowing and difficult as the physical elements. And above all, this fretful sense of constant waiting comes as an unpleasant surprise to soldiers like Rally who had expected war to bring with it a constant barrage of action and violence. The fact that the lack of activity so unsettles the soldiers suggests that expectations play an important role in how people deal with and prepare for difficult situations. Having come already to face constant violent action, Rally finds himself psychologically unprepared for the quiet of the battlefront. Then suddenly he has to face intensely violent moments and once those end he has to settle into waiting again. By putting this cycle of inaction and action on display, Sheriff suggests that there's no true way to prepare for war which is simultaneously calmer and crueler than anything a soldier could ever imagine. When Rally first arrives he doesn't know what to make of the seemingly tranquil atmosphere in the trenches and it's clear he's disoriented by the fact that the war doesn't really adhere to his expectations. He thought the war would be hectic, dangerous at all times, however he finds himself in a relatively peaceful situation and he doesn't know what to make of this. Osborne on the other hand is more experienced as a soldier and he understands that this odd quiet is characteristic of most war zones. Still, Rally is disturbed by the fact that the battlefront is so different than what he had in mind and this ultimately reinforces the idea that knowing what to expect is an important part of staying psychologically grounded during wartime. The sense of anticipation in the trenches also unnerves Rally because of the seeming tranquility, which only further emphasises all the bad things that could happen. Now, for instance, if we think about what he says, he calls it uncanny, and he refers to the calm that presides over the battleground as seeming like they're just waiting for something. Whereas one might think that Rally would be glad the battlefront is quiet, the uncanny calmness of the trenches only makes him dread the possibility of violence all the more. Forced to spend his days passing the time with bated breath, it feels as if he's just waiting for something terrible to happen. And this, Osborne tells him, is simply the nature of war. Osborne tries to teach Rally to predict the very unpredictability of war. The only thing a soldier can know for sure is that he can't know for sure when something bad is going to happen, only that something bad will happen. Osborne shows Rally the cycle of inaction and action that characterises military combat, trying to get the young soldier to see waiting as an unavoidable part of war. Despite the fact that they can never know what to expect and even when to expect it, Rally's fellow soldiers try to give themselves a sense of control or order over the passage of time. For instance, Trotter sketches out a chart full of 144 circles, one for each hour of the six days, which he and others spend in the trenches before retreating to safety. And he crosses off the circle one by one, which grows Trotter to the feeling that he's somehow actively participating in how time passes and once he breaks the days down into smaller measurements of time suddenly everything feels far more manageable to him. Now we then find that in this moment the audience does see Trotter focusing on something that's tangible and constant. After all though something terrible might happen in the intervening time hours and minutes they do pass and in turn Trotter thus gives himself something to expect managing to ground himself psychologically. In addition to Trotter's time chart, Sheriff installs an overarching countdown in Journey's End as Captain Stanhope learns that the Germans will stage a massive attack on the fourth day of his infantry's six-day stint in the trenches. As such, the entire play becomes something of a ticking time bomb. 
By suggesting that the Germans will attack on a certain day, Sheriff gives the soldiers, as well as we as the audience, a full sense of certainty. They technically know when to brace themselves, but they don't know when the exact time the Germans will strike will be, nor do they know what form the attack will take. In turn, the supposed certainty only exacerbates the sense of anticipation, making them dread the unknown all the more. Thus, Sheriff puts us as the audience members in a similar position to the soldiers, inviting us to inhabit the turbulent emotional realm of someone awaiting doom in the trenches, knowing only that something bad will eventually happen. And above all, this technique emphasises the terror of anticipating war, suggesting that even the mere threat of violence can be just as harrowing as experiencing violence itself. Now, another theme is that of fear. So all of the soldiers and journeys end find different ways to cope with their fear. In fact, their responses to fear can be broken down into three categories acceptance, denial and evasion. In general, most emotionally stable characters are those who accept the situation. These are people like Osborne and Raleigh who acknowledge their own fear and unfortunate circumstances but still bravely carry out their soldiers' duties. Stanhope, on the other hand, tries to stifle and thus deny his fear by drinking heavily while Hibbert tries to escape the war altogether but are lying about various ailments. However, the soldiers best able to handle fear, like Osborne and Raleigh, end up meeting their worst fate, whilst the least brave characters like Stanhope and Hibbert apparently escape unscathed. In this way, Sheriff, the playwright, intimates that although fear and cowardice are generally not desirable traits, they are perhaps appropriate reactions to the gruesomely violent circumstances of war. In other words, the coping mechanisms that actually help someone get through war are not necessarily those lauded in everyday life. Soldiers like Osborne and Raddy don't like their circumstances, but they learn to generally accept that they have to live under the constant threat of death. Indeed, they do what they can to normalise the situations. When Raddy first arrives, he talks to Osborne about his journey to the battlefront, a journey that took him through a number of underground passageways and trenches. And in this way, he looked up and saw the flares known as very lights, lights sent into the air by soldiers to track the enemies during the night. Despite the ominous nature of the very lights, both Raleigh and Osborne mentally reframe them to make them less frightening. And in this moment, the audience find that Osborne and Raleigh's ability to reframe parts of the war shift their attitude so that they can deal with otherwise quite terrifying circumstances. Thinking of the very lights as romantic ultimately enables them to ignore or at least not focus on ominous notions of violence and death. Simply put, they make the best of the situation. Stanhope's response to fear thus represents the second category of coping mechanisms, one called denial. Everyone in his infantry sees him as a brave captain, but in reality he's just as scared and upset as everyone else, if not more so. The night Osborne, Stanhope's close friend and second in command, dies in action, Stanhope parties the night away eating special foods and encouraging his men to join him in drinking champagne and whiskey. Braddy, who can't bring himself to participate in festivities, eventually asks Stanhope how he can eat and drink so heartily after Osborne's death. And Stanhope shouts at him, to forget you little fool, to forget. You think there's no limit to what a man can bear? With this exclamation, Stanhope straightforwardly shows how he gets through the war. He searches for distractions to forget the terrible things that have happened, and he recognises that there are limits to what a man can bear, so he turns to superficial diversions as a way of moving forward. Like Stanhope, Officer Hibbert also has a hard time accepting the circumstances, however rather than drinking, he tries to lie his way out of military by claiming he has a bad illness. This is more of an evasive tactic than a coping mechanism, something Hibbert uses so he doesn't have to fear his fa face his fear at all. Now, the true reason why Hibbert is trying to leave, of course we learn, is that he hates the trenches. And when he tries to maintain he's different to others, Stanhope objects and tells him that he feels exactly the same. Now, after saying this, he encourages Hibbert to drink the same whiskey that Stanhope himself drinks. This he upholds as the only thing that enables him to keep from going crazy. In a separate conversation with Osborne about his first few years in the military, Stanhope even confesses there was only two ways of breaking the strain. One was pretending I was ill, the other going home, the other was this, and he holds his glass up, which of course we know that is drinking. Taken in conjunction with this conversation with Hibbert, this solidifies the fact that Stanhope actively uses alcohol as a coping mechanism, suggesting the only difference between someone like him and someone like Hibbert is that he's willing to numb himself in the world to preserve his ability to go on functioning despite his fear. Now, of all the characters and journeys end, Oswald and Raleigh are perhaps the most emotionally well balanced. They don't use alcohol as a psychological crutch and they don't avoid, they don't rather adopt escapist attitudes. However, they are also the only two characters in the play that die. 
Whilst the playwright Sheriff certainly doesn't condemn their bravery, there's no overlooking the fact that none of the other characters lose their lives over the course of the play. It's only to be expected then that the audience might wonder if Oswald and Raleigh's brave response to a dismal situation is almost unnatural since it involves an acceptance of the unnatural violence of war. Although the positive attitude they display is sought after and praised in the military, it's also what leads them to danger, since their willingness to carry out their duties is what encourages the colonel to choose them as the only two men fit to lead a particularly risky raid on the German trenches. In a sense then, their acceptance of their own fear only invites more violence and danger into their lives. The fact that they're the only characters who die ultimately calls into question what kind of response is appropriate when it comes to war and fear. Responding level-headedly to the insanity of violence, Sheriff intimates, is actually unnatural, whereas acting out of self-preservation is a natural and beneficial human instinct even, so, even if doing so makes a person appear dysfunctional or cowardly. Now, another theme is that of fate and futility. So Sheriff presents to us as the audience the cyclical nature of life during war. The soldiers in trenches try to organise their lives around eating meals, drinking tea, sleeping and taking orders which ultimately adds a repetitive quality to their collective existence. Indeed, they're always either standing watch or waiting to stand watch. And what's more, the kind of violence that characterises trench warfare itself is repetitive. The attacks come intermittently, such that the soldiers know what to expect or not when to expect it. In turn, this leads to the feelings of powerlessness and futility, as if no matter what the soldiers do and no matter how they prepare, the war will continue forever. And this sensation of helplessness as futility pervades the play. Characters like Stanhope undergo what can only be called existential crises, questioning the agency he has in his own life. He develops new perspectives regarding his position in the world. In this way, Sheriff highlights the psychological process that soldiers experience when they feel there is little they can do to influence their lives. Under this interpretation, repetition leads to a sense of futility, and this futility threatens to significantly restructure the way a person conceives of their own existence. By showcasing this progression, Sheriff illustrates to the audience exactly how war alters a person's perspective on life in general. From the very first scene of the play, Sheriff infuses Journey's end with cyclical imagery. When Osborne arrives in the trenches and speaks to Hardy, the man whose position is taken over, the two men notice an earwig acting strangely on the table. This is a perfect representation of the way the setting of Journey's End ensnares its characters, keeping them trapped in the trenches doing the same thing over and over again. Of course, the earwig itself might think it's actually gone somewhere rather than simply retrace its own steps. Similarly, any sense of progress the soldiers experience in the trenches is superficial fleeting. For instance, Stanhope privately criticises Hardy for not tidying up the trenches before leaving, but when Osborne suggests that he himself will clean the trenches the following day, Stanhope laughs and makes it clear he doesn't truly believe such superficial concerns actually matter. As Stanhope shows his mounting apathy, the audience begins to understand that such chores do nothing to truly influence the war. The soldiers can clean the trenches all they want, but doing so will only momentarily distract them from the cycle of violence and fear that monopolises the day in and day out. The circling airwig, they're merely kept keeping themselves, or rather like the circling airwig, they are merely keeping themselves busy without achieving anything substantial. Of all the soldiers, Stanhope is the most influenced by futility of his wartime efforts. However, he's the captain of the infantry, so he also tries to stick to protocol, even though doing so feels futile. As he proceeds in this manner though, the repetitive na nature of his duties wears on him more and more until he starts questioning not only the useful of his own efforts, but the entire point of his existence. This soul searching does come out in the conversations that he has with Osborne. He has a desire to break things into tangible parts and see right through them, which makes sense for someone struggling to put together his life in a way that creates a greater meaning. As a captain, Stanhope has to adhere to everyday patterns and duties, but nothing he does seems to contribute meaningfully to ending the war. No matter what happens, the Germans keep attacking, and he and his comrades keep doing the same things over and over, keeping themselves pointly occupied, pointlessly occupied in the trenches. Thus, the components of Stanhope's everyday life don't add up to anything significant. It's unsurprising then that he's began to see right through ordinary things, wondering how they might all add up to make something of value. Struggling to find the point of his soldierly efforts, he begins to question the very nature of his existence. Sheriff doesn't allow Stanhope, or any of his other characters, to ever gain any sort of closure regarding the significance of the military action. This is because as a playwright, he's interested in exploring the existential problems that arise when people have trouble finding meaning in their everyday lives. 
not in the conclusions they may or may not reach. Indeed, the play itself ends in the middle of a battle, suggesting that the violence to which the soldiers have become accustomed will inevitably continue. This in turn makes their effort seem somewhat pointless, and this outlook reconfigures the, the way they think, forcing them to question their purpose. Most importantly, Stanhope exemplifies how the search for meaning easily turns inwards as he grasps at existential quandaries and re-examines his place in the world. This, it seems, is what Sheriff is most interested in revealing. The fact that, despite its patterns and protocols, war is an inscrutable thing that has the power to fundamentally alter the way people conceive of life itself. So that's all. If you found this video useful, we'd really appreciate it if you gave it a big thumbs up and also consider subscribing to our channel. But also make sure you visit our website www.firstrate.tutors.com. There you can find lots of useful study guides as well as revision material if you're studying this play for your coursework or exams and indeed other areas of English. Thanks so much for listening.